now want to turn to our next speaker who is going to uh, continue on with this theme, but in a very different atmosphere from that that we have here on Earth, and that's Venus. Uh, David and I have known each other for many decades, um, more than I care to uh, think how many. Uh, but he has had a very spectacular and fascinating career. He has uh, specialized in many different things, one of them being um, an outreach spokesman for science in general, and of course planetary science and astrobiology in particular. He's currently a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, and he's also an adjunct professor at uh, Chris McKay's and my PhD alma mater, the University of Colorado. So let me turn it over to you, David, and tell us about Venus and make the case for life. Thanks. Thanks, Penny. Thank you all for, for being here. It looks as though uh, David broke the podium, so now I'm, I'm free to wander like a, a microbe in the clouds. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here uh, for this exciting um, discussion where we're, we're going to break on through to the other side. I want to talk to you um, during my brief time about uh, an idea that, uh, that may seem heretical. Um, I suppose it is, but in astrobiology, of course, uh, anything we think we know is provisional, so we need, we need our heresies as well. Uh, I want to talk to you about the case for life today on Venus. Now, of course, historically, uh, Venus was put very much up on a pedestal. Uh, before the space age, we were sold this idea of Venus as an earthly paradise uh, by scientists as well as science fiction writers. Here's um, Sir uh, Arthur Eddington telling us that um, Venus would be well adapted for life similar to ours. Uh, and that's what we thought right up until we started going there with spacecraft. And science fiction writers like Isaac Asimov gave us wonderful stories of adventures in the deep oceans of Venus fighting uh, giant jellyfish and telepathic frogs and things in, in this story. And of course, Hollywood went wild with our um, sort of stereotypical Western mythical ideas about Venus. Um, and, and so we had a set of ideas about Venus. Uh, it was very much, uh, we had high expectations for Venus before we went there to find out what it's really like. And I think that didn't serve Venus very well. Because when we actually went to Venus, of course, it wasn't like that at all. The very first spacecraft to any other planet was Mariner 2. And when we got there in 1962, we uh, uh, found the very first instrumental result of any spacecraft was from the, the uh, spectrophotometer on, uh, or the microwave radiometer, sorry, on Mariner 2. And what we learned from that experiment was that this isn't the way Venus is. Venus is very, very hot uh, on the surface and therefore dry and devoid of organic life. And in fact, the way this was reported, having been set up and put up on that pedestal was Venus says no in the New York Times in 1963. And it's really, uh, the message from Venus reduces our hope and uh, Venus may mark the beginning of the end of mankind's grand romantic dreams. What a bummer Venus is. You know, like a killjoy, a buzzkill. Uh, so, so that was sort of the setup. And we've learned a lot since then, but I think that that grand disappointment sort of set the stage for a lot of, in a way, current attitudes about Venus that I think have probably proven false in that increasingly Venus is a very interesting and I would say essential target for astrobiological exploration if we want to understand habitability uh, in solar systems and exoplanets and even I think the possibility of life today in exotic environments. So uh, Venus has this sort of taint that I think it doesn't really deserve but I think that history uh, determines why it's regarded as a sort of um, uh, off limits for um, interesting astrobiological exploration, and I think that's wrong. Um, one of the early results that was widely publicized when we did start exploring Venus with missions like um, Pioneer Venus uh, in the 70s and all the wonderful um, Soviet uh, Venus entry probes and landers was uh, the, the first models of the runaway greenhouse done by um, the great Jim Casting and others were of necessity pretty simple. The question is, how do you get rid of it? If Venus started off as we think it did, and there's a lot of good evidence I won't go into right now for thinking Venus started off with more or less an Earth's 
abundance of water, what happened to it? And the overall idea you've heard about, I'm not even going to describe here, the runaway greenhouse, the positive feedback between opacity of water and surface temperature and that leading to the loss of an ocean. But the first models of that, as I said, were of necessity pretty simple. And what they showed was that you can get rid of an ocean very quickly if you make certain assumptions, hundreds of millions of years. And that became the accepted canonical time scale. Except those early models didn't handle really the physics in a very sophisticated way. For one thing, they didn't handle clouds at all. And there's a reason for that. Clouds are really hard to model. So they just painted an albedo onto the planet and assumed, well, that represents clouds. And it turns out that dominates the time scale for the ocean you get. But the, that notion that Venus has, for most of its life, been without an ocean and been the hot sort of hellhole it is today, again, became widely accepted, but I think it's wrong. Recent results, where we finally learned how to, I think, do the problem right, using a 3D, using a GCM of the kind we use to study and model future climate on Earth, show that the, the um, situation's more complicated, and indeed it is the effect of clouds when you treat them correctly that change the story and suggest the oceans of Venus may have persisted for much longer. And an intriguing result in the context of our discussion here today, an intriguing implication, is that Venus may have been a habitable planet conventionally defined with an oxygenated atmosphere and a surface ocean for much of solar system history. There may have been these two oceanic planets right next door to each other. Uh, I won't go into detail about this now, but here's a paper that we published in GRL um, last year with the, uh, the, the title, Was Venus the First Habitable World of Our Solar System? Um, and this is with Mike Way and another group of atmospheric modelers at, at GIST, the Goddard Institute for space studies, and this is what happens when we apply a good 3D GCM and, and attempt to really do the clouds right. And uh, the key point you'll see up here on the left, Venus may have had a climate with liquid water on its surface for something like two billion years. The time scale's still uh, not very well known. It is a hard problem, but the main reason we get such a different result does have to do with the behavior of the clouds. And it's very interesting for some assumptions, and you have to make assumptions, we know so little about the early qualities of Venus, but for reasonable assumptions about rotation rate, rotation rate turns out to be key, and a little bit about surface topography, the clouds sort of organize themselves in a way as to be an ideal cooling mechanism for Venus, in that it turns out, because of the way the clouds interact with the global circulation, that for much of this time, the sun-facing side of Venus is completely cloudy and the anti-sun side of Venus is mostly free of clouds. And if you think about that, that's ideal for keeping your planet cool. If we were trying to engineer something for Earth, you know, maybe we should <laughs> at some point, we would do something similar, a, a, a very reflective sun shield on the sun-facing side and a completely effective radiator on the, on the uh, night side. Venus seems to have done that. And if we're right that it did, it helped keep the surface uh, suitable for liquid water for much, much longer. Um, and so, it may well be that during much of the time where right next door on Earth there was this evolution of the origin of life and uh, photosynthesis and various more complex and diverse kinds of life, that right next door there was another oceanic planet, likely even exchanging material with our planet, as we've heard about. Um, so, could there be life on Venus today? Um, I've already made this top point here, the top couple of points, but the real question is then, as the surface conditions became hostile, could life have somehow, uh, as life does, uh, adapted, um, and perhaps adapted to an atmospheric niche? At this point, it's worth pointing out that the clouds of Venus today are in many ways a pretty benign environment. And it's interesting, I'll go through this a little bit more, but we just heard from David Smith the three reasons why the clouds on Earth are not green. Each of those three reasons is, um, is somewhat mitigated on Venus. Well, uh, the, the stability, uh, the, the particle lifetimes, the UV radiation, and the cold. It's different on Venus. In fact, it's, if you go to one bar here, it's more or less room temperature, or maybe, maybe slightly uncomfortably warm, but it's certainly around Earth 
surface pressure, it's also around Earth's surface temperature. And so in that very crude uh, thermodynamic sense, there's a habitable zone in the clouds of Venus. Uh, there are other characteristics that maybe are habitable, to uh, 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 conducive to life. This top point, I think, is important. Particle lifetimes are much longer than on Earth. And uh, in, in, interestingly, there are certain latitudes where it seems as though the, the, cloud, the, the cloud droplets do not fall, uh, in that the dynamics are such that the upwelling is comparable to the fall speed. This is something that we need to investigate much more carefully. Uh, Venus uh, is uh, one of my persistent pitches to you will be that Venus is underexplored compared to the level of interest we should have in it. But it seems as though um, the lifetimes are months, and in some places, maybe sort of permanent. Um, there are, I won't go into this, the microphysics are complex, but there are three modes of cloud particles represented by these three sizes of circles. And the very largest ones are called mode three. Um, they're kind of huge for cloud particles. They're, they're a multi-micron up to, um, I think the um, average size is uh, three microns, but they go up to more than 10 microns in size. They make up most of the mass of the cloud deck, and we don't completely know what they're made out of. They're obviously coated with sulfuric acid, but like the rest of the clouds, but they seem to have some other core material that the optical properties are not consistent with um, pure sulfuric acid, and if you try to match the spectral data um, with the uh, the albedo and the you know, real and imaginary refractive indices of these particles and all that, you can, cannot do it if they're pure sulfuric acid. There's something else in there. And strangely, some of the Pioneer Venus entry probe results suggest that the largest of these may not be spherical, and we're not sure why that is. So there, there's some weird stuff that uh, takes up a lot of mass in those clouds. Uh, it's been pointed out um, that the super rotation of the atmosphere shortens the duration of the night. Even though Venus rotates very slowly, the clouds whip around every four days, so if you were dependent on sunlight, the night would not last very long. And there's some weird chemical disequilibrium in the clouds that's not well understood or characterized that is at least potentially a source of breakfast. Um, so there's also this unknown ultraviolet absorber, and you could see, when you look at Venus in the ultraviolet, it makes these beautiful patterns. The patterns come and go on different spatial and temporal scales, and um, have, actually, the closer you look, they, they have really rather bizarre behavior, and the, the, the temporal fluctuations can be sh extreme and short-lived. And this stuff, whatever it is, and it's not been identified, absorbs more than half the solar energy striking Venus. It absorbs a boatload of solar photons in the high-energy ultraviolet. Um, it seems to be related to sulfur, or maybe chlorine, but nobody, and a lot of people have been trying for years, nobody's nailed it in a lab as far as what the spectrum, what this stuff really is. Um, and it's been floated, I guess that's a good word, um, a few times as a possible biological pigment. I wrote about this in 1997. And uh, again, there's a paper in the current issue of astrobiology by Sanjay LeMay and colleagues uh, elaborating on this idea in a more sophisticated way. Um, and I, I don't have a lot of time, but I'll just say there are some papers that have uh, speculated on, given what we know about the cloud environment, what the possible metabolic basis could be. Um, it could, could have to do with sulfur, which not only is um, out of equilibrium there and a potential energy source, but also a lot of terrestrial organisms use sulfur as an ultraviolet sunscreen. Um, and there's another paper that David mentioned that's this is the one that, that by LeMay and all, David's a co-author on that in the current issue of Astrobiology that um, goes into a little more detail about this ultraviolet absorber and um, uh, similarities be uh, between spectral characteristics of Venus and some organisms on Earth and a little bit more about the, the possible physics of how a biota could be maintaining itself on Venus. And David already showed this, and, and I won't go into it. Time is very short, but they, they uh, do talk about the possibility of a sulfur iron-based metabolism. There's plenty of sulfur. There is iron observed in the clouds. Not a lot of it, and it's a kind of observation that we need to do again to make sure a lot of these experiments were done one by a Russian, once by a Russian entry probe and you know, in the early 80s, we would love to apply 21st century technology to this interesting problem. Um, so um, what would it be powering itself by this 
potential Venusian life. There's a possibility of phototrophic organisms. This UV absorber, if it were biological, there's a huge amount of energy. Of course, the problem is, can, light, can life really use UV? It doesn't on Earth, but again, we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, these organisms presumably didn't evolve on Earth. Is there a way to come to take advantage of this great energy source? Life's evolution seems to be a very resourceful process. There's also the idea of chemical life. There are these sources of disequilibrium. Again, my time is very short, so I won't go into detail, but there seem to be uh, free energy up there, and um, I refer you to the papers I've been mentioning, and I'm happy to distribute them if you want to know more. Carbonyl sulfide is a very interesting molecule for terrestrial biology. There's a lot of it there. Um, Th these are the objections I've heard to this idea since I, when I first started talking about this about 20 years ago, Chris McKay asked me, why aren't the clouds green? And I'm glad to have this raised again. I will point out that the clouds on Venus are different from the clouds on Earth in ways, in some ways that organisms might prefer. They're continuous, they're deep, they're stable, they are room temperature and pressure. So. On a, 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 an imaginary Venusian organism might look at the clouds of Earth and say, there's no way those are habitable. Um, strong acid, very quickly, uh, you know about extremophiles, acid-loving organisms on Earth. I think this is actually Penny in Coava de la Luz um, sticking her hands unadvisedly <laughs> into some strong sulfuric acid water to get some God knows what. But the point is, extremophile organisms, we've learned that there are lots of organisms on Earth that love it. In, strong acid. The red stuff here in the tree of life, this is all the stuff that thrives in strong acid. As it says over here, the, the organisms that thrive at low pH are distributed all over the tree of life, suggesting that the ability to live um, in acid is not only plausible, but rampant. I, won't, I, I think I'm pretty much out of time. So there are biogenic elements, all the obviously needed ones, and there are hints of um, magnesium, iron, all these other really juicy elements that, again, we would love to go back and really confirm those results. So I'll conclude with some science questions we'd love to address with future uh, exploration. Uh, we want to know what that UV absorber is. Whether or not it turns out to be related to some local biology, it's an interesting question. It has a huge effect on the radiative qualities of our neighboring Earth-like planet. So we need to know what it is. Um, I won't go through these, you can read them, but there are a lot of interesting questions about the clouds and um, atmospheric circulation, and of course, uh, we would love to grab some of those cloud particles and analyze them and look for organics, and even, as Carolyn suggested for Enceladus, look for organisms. Um, so I'll end on a philosophical note. Venus is our only other example of an Earth-sized terrestrial planet and a currently active terrestrial planet in uh, the, you know, an endogenously uh, uh, sourced sense. Most of the surface is quite young, and if we think beyond the specifics of a particular chemical system required for life, we can ask about the general properties of an inhabited planet that it must possess. <coughs> Judging from our example of one, not a very good sample for doing serious science, but the answers might include an atmosphere with signs of flagrant chemical disequilibrium, solar-driven chemical and dynamical cycles, an active internally driven cycle cycling of volatile elements between these different reservoirs. And at present, the only two planets we know of which today possess these characteristics are Earth and Venus. And this is obviously important for, uh, for doing a good job with the exoplanets because atmospheric disequilibrium is, uh, has become our most obvious biosignature. We need to understand the atmospheric disequilibrium that we see on Venus. So this is my last slide. Uh, we in astrobiology have to be careful not to have too many preconceived notions um, with this, this field that, for obvious reasons, we don't completely know what it is we're looking for. All ideas about extraterrestrial life are extrapolations from a single example. This is necessary, but requires humility. And everything we conclude about what is universal, we have to regard as provisional. So let's try to resist groupthink. Some potential locales for life, I think, become more acceptable because we repeat them a lot at our meetings. It is plausible that life exists within the ocean of an ice-covered world that has never seen sunlight. We need to search there. It is plausible that life exists underground within a planet that is largely geologically dead. We need to search there. And it is plausible that life exists within the clouds of a planet with vibrant chemical flows, energy sources, stable aqueous environments, 
and so forth. Among the plausible niches for extraterrestrial life in our solar system, the clouds of Venus are among the most accessible and among the least well explored. Thank you. Time, time for one very good question. And so we've got one very good questioner in the front row here. <laughs> OK, so I'm just going to press on one issue. The clouds are stable. They're, OK. But I presume that there's continual um, what, evaporation of droplets and the creation of new ones. Doesn't that make for a very unstable environment for organisms to live? Yes, potentially. This is one of the It's a very good question. Um, and there's been some thought given to this, but not enough. But if you compare the reproductive time scales of bacteria at, um, you know, at the temperature of this room, that time scale is very, very short compared to the lifetime of these cloud particles. So one can imagine a biota um, where uh, you, know, you don't have to live forever. You have to spread yourself to your neighboring cloud particles to maintain um, an ecosystem. And if the probability of that is high enough, then it's OK if, if uh, you're going to fall and die. In fact, we all die. But the question is, do you have time to reproduce and spread before you die? So it's, it's a question of dynamics. It's, you know, people talk about microphysics. I think we need to work on microbiophysics. And I think da people like David Smith um, are, um, you know, we should, we should talk to him uh, later over a beer about this question. It's a great question. Uh, 